This is a US $100 bill. This is a US Silver Eagle. One of them's money, one of them's currency, and the difference is huge. Let's talk about that. In the words of Mike Maloney, true wealth is your time and freedom. Today we have a big disconnect between the words currency and money because we don't have a definition, you know, broadly that a lot of people understand what that difference is between currency and money. So I got a little definition here. So currency and money are both a medium of exchange, a unit of account. They're portable, they're durable, they're divisible, they're fungible, which means they're interchangeable, but money is a store of value, right? Currency is not. So is the US dollar money or currency? What's the deal with that? Well, in 1971, August 15th, Richard Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard. This broke the tie between money and currency of what the US dollar is. So no longer was our currency tied to real money, gold and silver. It was essentially just paper money, fiat currency. Now fiat money, we'll call it fiat currency, is currency that is created by the government, more so the Federal Reserve actually, right? It's not the US government, it's the Federal Reserve that prints this stuff. So our money, we'll call it currency, because that's what it is, is not backed by a commodity, nothing with you know a demand to it. This is paper money that the Fed can essentially just print and print and print. So currency has no intrinsic value. Uh, you know, basically every currency that's ever been in existence goes to its inherent value of zero over time. So why the heck do we print currency? I'll tell you about that. So printing currency gives the government better control over managing the money supply. This helps with things like credit, liquidity, and interest rates. Printing currency gives central banks and governments more control over the money supply and the economy, but at the expense of buying power. So when you increase the currency supply, the first new dollar that comes off the printing press is less valuable than the dollar that was you know, just before that. So right when it comes off the printing press, that's when it has its greatest purchasing power and it just degrades from there. And of course there are downsides of printing currency. Printing currency gives us bouts of inflation and hyperinflation. You know, we have extreme examples like in Zimbabwe where they had, a, 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 you know, a peak in 2008, a daily inflation rate of 98%. If we go back to the Weimar Republic of Germany, you know, in 1921, they had a peak daily inflation of 20.9%. Yes, these are extreme examples, but it just goes to show, you know, what is possible when you have currency and you just print it to oblivion. So the average national inflation for the United States is pegged to about 2%. So how do, you, how do you get that 2%? Where does the number come from? So inflation is calculated from something called the CPI, the Consumer Price Index. Now what they do is they take the cost of market basket of a current period and divide that over the cost of market basket in the base period. You then multiply that by 100 and that'll give you a percent. Now the market basket includes things like apparel, education, and transportation. Now when most economists are computing the CPI, they use the core CPI. The core CPI leaves out things like food, energy, and stocks, which are arguably some of the most important, you know, pieces of a society, you know, to kind of weigh your prices and stuff. Um, but they say they don't include it because those are often too volatile. So inflation, guys, is a silent killer, right? If your, you know, grandparents have the Folgers coffee can and they bury their money in the backyard in it, over time, it's, you know, you're already losing 2% of that purchasing power year over year, maybe, you know, two years from now, it might not be that much, but you know, 50, 60 years from now, it's going to basically be worthless. So $50,000 a hundred years ago might've been a small fortune, right? It was worth, you know, roughly a little over $700,000 in terms of today's purchasing power. Whereas $50,000 today, you know, isn't even the average household medium income. Just for a little fact on the side here, $5 in 1920 has the same purchasing power as 38 cents in today's money. So that just kind of shows you, you know, the steep decline that this has over time, right? It's punishing savers. The government wants you to spend your money and inflation is one way um, that they're able to accomplish that because they don't want those economic wheels to begin to slow down. You know, they do things like increase the currency supply so that there's more money flowing through the system and decreasing interest rates to encourage borrowing and spending. And so for all those reasons I just mentioned, guys, that's why I only trust true money, gold and silver. So what can you do with this information? So the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do, guys, is grow your money at at least 2%, right? Just to keep up with inflation to maintain your purchasing power. You know, guys, one of the things that I like so much about gold and silver is they act as 
sponges that absorb the you know currency that's been printed it does an accounting for all of that currency if you look at a graph of the purchasing power of gold and silver more or less it's a sideways line that does this right it's maintaining its purchasing power over time another thing you can do is hold positions in real money gold and silver this is not only going to you know kind of help protect you against inflation but against economic downturns. Now, gold and silver are the more traditional investments when it comes to you know, safe haven assets, but something else that I would also loop in there would be cryptocurrency, right? Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin has been referred to as digital gold. And you know, there's a lot of arguments where you could make that case. One of the things that make me more you know, inclined to purchase gold and silver rather than something like Bitcoin, is it's got thousands of year track record you know, of not only doing this accounting, but uh, you know, protecting um, and maintaining that purchasing power over time. There's the suit example, right? In ancient Rome, you could have gotten, you know, one ounce of gold would get a man a nice toga and sandals, like a nice, you know, dress him, dress a man. Uh, you know, today, one ounce of gold would also dress a man, right? It'll get him a nice suit and shoes, you know, whatever. So that largely, you know, stays true today. You know, guys, at the end of the day, the best thing you can do with this information is educate and inform yourself, you know, look into economics, look into gold and silver, look into all these things, um, and so that you can make informed, intelligent investment decisions when it comes to, you know, not, not only maintaining your purchasing power, but growing your money over time. So my message to you is to expand your financial education and, you know, really get out there and learn more about this stuff because, you know, what you don't know can hurt you. And I want you guys to be protected against, you know, economic uncertainty and all that kind of stuff and increase your financial acumen so that you can, you know, survive those ups and downs. All right, guys, that's going to do it for me. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please subscribe, hit that like button if you got value out of this, and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.